Well, one of the reasons why it's good to be asking questions is because questions elicit a response. They, they generate a, a connection and relationship because of the, there's a profound background expectations in our culture is that when you're asked a question, you're obliged or expected to respond. Um, and uh, this has both positive and negative you know, dimensions to it. But generally speaking, when people orient themselves to questioning or asking questions, there's an entry, in a willingness to engage and to be in connection. Now, to me, that is the, then the beginning of a co-constructive process. I came to realize that if I develop two axes that could clarify some of the underlying intentionality in my decision making about what to ask and how to ask it, that might help me to become better skilled as an interviewer. The first dimension that I came across that I thought was useful was the dimension of orienting intent and influencing intent. Now, the orienting intent is ground, uh, provides more honest questions. Like we, if we don't know something, we ask a question to elicit some answer to help us to get oriented with respect to what we don't know. So those are more honest, quote unquote, questions, right? But because our, our interview, like the reason we as clinicians are in a relationship to start with is because there's a purpose for our, our, our meeting, which is to enable therapeutic change, right? So obviously the intention of us being together is to produce therapeutic change. So there are influencing questions that are quite different than orienting questions. Now, if I ask influencing questions, which is more, quote, honest with respect to the purpose of our relationship, and if I listen to the answer to the influencing question, I get oriented anyway. So there's a, there's a, there's a double benefit if I work at the continuum, the end of the continuum of influencing questions. And looking at the dimension of lineality versus circularity, and I was fascinated with Bateson's idea that phenomena of mind are grounded in circular, more complex phenomena. And yet I realized that so many of our questions are not grounded in that. And, and I, I could see that, especially in my background as a, as a psychiatrist, uh, when I ask questions to make an, an assessment of a patient to determine whether they have a mental illness or not, I ask lineal questions where the questions are grounded in a, in a time a process of the past, present, and future. So, so the, there's an arrow of time is the context within which I'm making an inquiry. So I ask about past events that lead to present misery or future dreaded expectations that also contribute to present misery, right? But I see these as lineal questions because they, they're, they're grounded in an assumption of events taking place over time. So that to me was a very useful uh, realization that some questions could be lineal in terms of falling into that framework. But there's another way of looking at time, and that is to see time as being constructed in the present. And so that's the circular view of time, so, so that the past exists in the present and the future also exists in the present. And this then, and the, the way in which the past and future is in the present determines you know, present activity. Right? So I realized that we could ask questions on that vertical axis of lineality versus circularity. And the circularity was very useful in sort of privileging the systemic ideas of patterns of interaction and circular process and so forth. And so I found that, oh, those are really useful questions because if I ask circular questions, what I happens is that not only do I get a better understanding of relational dynamics, the family, in listening to their own answers, also enter into more systemic understanding. So then if I move across the, the axis of orienting versus um, influencing, then the lineality and circularity also becomes helpful. Because in the upper you know, right-hand quadrant, where I'm looking into um, you know, the future and so forth, then if I have an idea that I think is a good idea, and this is where they should go to solve their problem, then I can ask a question to push them, as it were, in that direction, ask a strategic question, and, you know, and, and so forth. Um, 
But one of the problems with that is that if you ask strategic questions and you push people to think and live the way in which you think they ought to live and think, rather than how they want themselves, then they often it evokes uh, a resistance or oppositionality. And so the, the, the interview gets more tense because no one likes to be told what to do, right? So strategic questions become problematic often in a process of maintaining a good relationship with the client, right? Whereas reflexive questions are more grounded in the assumption of circularity, where if we ask in such a way that we are not directing the process, but the question becomes more of a probe or a perturbation or an invitation, inviting some kind of reflection or bringing forth a possibility, that is enriching. And if I ask a question to try to bring forth a possibility, but the client doesn't you know, see that as a possibility for them, and I sense that they don't see it, then what I do is I try to influence them in a different domain. So I, start, I move my question to another domain ask a question here to open this possibility. If they can't move there, then I open a place here. I keep on moving my question to find a space that opens possibilities for them. <music> One of the things that is so important is to listen to the listening of the other the whole time you're asking the questions because what you intend as a circular question may not be experienced by them as a circular question or what you intend as a reflexive question may not be experienced that way, maybe experienced strategically or lin even as a linear question. And in the interventive, interventive interviewing article, part three, I think I give an example of how the same question can be asked from all four quadrants and have quite different effects. Right? Uh, so it's, it's incumbent upon us as interviewers to become aware of the possible effects or probable or improbable effects of different kinds of questions. I since came to the view that just like you cannot not communicate, you cannot not intervene. So without realizing it, we're probably always intervening in the autonomous functioning of the other. <music> However, at the same time, I want to point out a limitation of the framework, and that is that if you get too much into this framework, what happens is that too much of your energy goes into thinking about your questions and you lose connection with the client. So my suggestion is, if that ever happens, abandon the framework, forget about it, go with your intuitive knowledge, which is broader than your conscious knowledge, and stay in that place. But if you've got mental energy left, then use it to reflect upon where you are in terms of this, these quadrants and what questions you're asking and what are the hoped for effects or the, your intentions in asking the questions and so forth. Because the clearer you become with respect to intentionality, the chances are greater you're going to be able to formulate a question that's more coherent with that intention and it's more likely to have the anticipated effects. Mm -hmm.